So greetings, everybody. Today we have the honor of speaking to a modern medicine woman. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our smart sister, Lena, is joining us today to share her insights and her experience bridging ancient wisdom with modern life. So this is going to be a really, really good conversation. It's going to be one of those that makes you go, mm hmm okay? So brace yourselves and um, I want to invite to a guest, Lena. Welcome to the show, Lena. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing really well and looking forward to diving into this juicy conversation. <laughs> Awesome. And dive, we will. So before we dive in, I want to remind all of our listeners that Lena's uh, bio, her work, her links, and everything she has been working on is in the description section. So you know how we do over here. We don't read our women bios because we, we, we want to spend every second having these conversations and they have extensive bios, people. They have pages long, okay? So go into the description and, you know, look around, browse around and see what picks your interest and then go for it, okay? So, Lena, I think we should start from the beginning. Can you share with us um, the journey that... Um, that led you into the path of becoming a medicine woman. Mm, thank you. Yes. You know, in this, this journey, like you said, it started from the beginning. So back when I was, you know, a child, I grew up in a really interesting household with a Vietnamese Buddhist mother and with a Presbyterian psychologist dad from Georgia um, here in the US. And it was, you know, so so I share that because the foundation of my work is directly related to the foundation of, you know, my ancestry. And yeah, in that, you know, there was this East West integration. And so when I was growing up, I had the experience of going to temple with my mother, mm -hmm. eating vegetarian food with the monks there, chanting, being in meditation and prayer. And all of those very rich spiritual rituals were threaded throughout my childhood and very, very much normalized. And then, you know, on certain Sundays, I would go to church with my dad. And it was, um, it was a beautiful it was a beautiful mix of spiritual upbringing and and there was a lot of acceptance and reverence for for each path and so one of the lessons that taught me was that there are so many paths to god and there are these various access points where we can connect with whether we call it god or the divine or energy beyond you know, ourselves, energy that connects us. And and so I saw that, you know, modeled to me. And of course, th things were not perfect. Uh, my mom also, you know, in the same breath, she was my first spiritual teacher, but she also carried a tremendous amount of trauma from her, from her upbringing, but also from being in a war-torn country and being the only one in her family to immigrate to the U.S. in 75. So her courageous move to uh, to the U.S. in search of a better life really was symbolic of that journey from east to west, from kind of a more, um, I would say, traditional way of living into a more modern life. And, and that's a foundation, uh, the found, a big foundation of the work that moves through me and that I share with the world. So... As I continued on, you know, and began to really understand, like as I was a kid and then growing up, I knew I was meant to help people. I didn't know what that looked like. So, um, so I just, you know, followed my intuition and I ended up going to study social work. So going through more of the traditional psychotherapy path and, um, and that's where my first in 
in social work school getting my master's. That's where my first really big spiritual awakening happened when my mom suddenly passed from a stroke at the age of 57. And that was, you know, so for me, it was the access point of grief. And through my grief, through that tremendous sadness and existential crisis, I began to really ask the questions that we ask in our awakening. Why am I here? If life, if human life is so fleeting, then why are we all here? You know, what are we doing here? And so the grief guided me back to some of the foundational practices of spiritual ritual and meditation that my mom originally taught me. So she was a teacher in her human form and then a teacher in spirit form. And when her human form was no longer here, it opened me up to the medicine of meditation and spiritual work. Now, when I use the word medicine, and this is part of the modern medicine woman uh, philosophy, medicine is our essence. It's our purpose. It's our, our unique gifts that we're meant to share with the world. So I use the word medicine in a more expansive context. It can also mean psychedelics. It can also mean um, different uh, plants, medicinal plants that grow out of Pachamama Mother Earth. So going back into that initial awakening, I began to really see that I had these gifts of guiding others on a path through their darkness and to um, begin to embody their light on the other side. And, and so that initial uh, loss then guided me down, you know, continued to progress me on my path. And I was guided then to travel around the world and study and learn from different spiritual teachers, different uh, tribes and lineages of medicinal healing, whether we're talking about plant medicine or um, non-entheogenic medicine. So earth medicines, you know, a couple of my lineages are based in Peru, where, um, for example, the Caro are beautiful Incan elders. So they're descendants of the Incas and they live high up in the Andes and preserve the wisdom teachings from their ancestors that were really at risk um, for, for a while as the Spanish were um, you know, infiltrating Peru and really um, attempting to extract and eradicate those wisdom teachings. So I, I'm very much connected to various um, shamanic and healing lineages and modalities around the world, and I integrate them together um, and I share them here in the modern world. So I really see myself as a bridge, just like my mom was a bridge, just like you know, my upbringing was a bridge and, and I'll pause there, but that's, that's really the, the strut, the strong foundation of the work that I am honored to share today. Yeah, that is beautiful. I mean, it's so beautiful when you really think of the scope of it, it's immense, <laughs> you know, it's a lot when, you know, when you're talking about learning, because I think you know, to learn the things you were learning, I think it took a lot of unlearning as well, you know, yeah. because you have to be open to receiving this. And I think that's what fascinates me about a lot of people who do work such as you do. I see a lot of the ability to be curious, to be open, to unlearn, to embrace, to, you know, and to do it. And I think I'd like you to tell us um, when you work with individuals to help them let's just say navigate life using these new strategies these newfound strategies and tools what does that look like because i think there's a wealth of knowledge in what you have beautifully defined as the ancient wisdom the sacred wisdom the sacred knowledge that is in these mountains of peru and in the villages of africa and in asia and in I mean, even here in Europe, you know, there's some places you will go, you know, in the Irish mountains and Celtics, there's a lot of knowledge in these places. How do you work with these individuals to help them, you know, bridge this gap and embrace this knowledge and apply it like, you know, daily? 
Yeah, th this looks different for every person. Um, and so when I'm sitting, so I work with individuals, I work with groups, I teach, you know, workshops and trainings. When I'm working with an individual, obviously it's a really intimate space. And so as I'm sitting across from them, I'm tuning into their energy field and I'm asking their energy field and their, their soul what they need, what medicine they need. So perhaps, um, perhaps someone may need some of the, the Buddhist based wisdom teachings from my, you know, from my mother's lineage in Southeast Asia, um, because they need more of that, let's say medicinal stillness and, um, maybe they, you know, in other lifetimes, for example, had lives in Asia and they need that reconnection, you know, so, so it's very much, um, energetically based when I'm in that space, I'm not Lena, I'm an instrument. Okay. So I, I've, you know, and I'm, I'm still human, but that work, this work, this healing work is very much, it's not about me at all. It is about, me being of service. And we talked about that, you know, before we came on here, being yeah, of, yeah. yeah, before being of service. So if I'm of service, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an avatar, you know, I'm an archetype when I put myself out there in the world, like right now, but I'm an instrument of medicine. And so to answer your question and to continue diving into that, it's all about what that person needs. So maybe someone needs a soul retrieval or an aspect retrieval, which is more of a shamanic um, technique and methodology to work with trauma. Maybe a part of their soul was fragmented when they had a childhood trauma experience, for example, and their soul will tell me, and then I'll bring in tools. If I need tools I have right here, um, I'll show you. Yeah, my, my mesa, so this is a mesa from the Pachacuti mesa um, tradition and lineage from the Caro in Peru, so from, from the Incan elders. And so that there's very, um, you know, there's energetically potent tools that I can bring into those sessions that I may use. Maybe I use some rattles to tease out stagnant energy, um, but it's mm -hmm. primarily energetically and based and soul based. And, um, and again, that person is telling me what they need. Yeah. What did you call that? A Mesa? A Mesa. Yeah. Mesa. Uh huh. Yeah. And so it's, it has, from Peru. it's from Peru. And so inside, inside mm -hmm. there's all these sacred objects. Mm -hmm. So crystals, stones, um, different sacred objects that have been either gifted to me or they've come to me in some way. So mm -hmm. when I use this um, for, for healing with people, mm -hmm. and when I open it, I can create like an altar, which is almost like a vortex. And we work with that, with that energy using the five directions. That is so interesting because, you know, a lot of these things, um, you know, and we have listeners <laughs> from all over, right? And uh -huh. we're going to have Christians listening, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, everybody, um, women who are into the sacred feminine goddess, energy, everybody's listening, right? And and I think a lot of the, the knowledge, like the one you are sharing right now, it's either hidden, and this is my perspective, and please feel free to clarify this, it's either um, hidden or it is demonized, and it is it is it is marketed as evil, as don't go there, don't touch it, you know, you know. And I get surprised by this, Lane, and I'd like you to talk about this. Why it is? Why we should really? I don't want to say start unlearning old things and really just you know become more curious and and you know just question. Since when was feathers evil? <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, and I'm just saying this to my listeners because I, I, I simplify things. I know I get that a lot, but if you make it too simple, but I'm really honest about the way I see it. Feathers are not evil. The stones are not evil. The rocks. When did this happen? So Lena, just help me clarify this because I know this is something that, you know, we know the feed, you know, the feedback people demonize shamanic yes. work and, you know, Absolutely. and all this stuff. 
Absolutely. And thank you for bringing this up because it's so important to demystify. Um, and I'll just share with you just a personal example of what you're talking about. When I was first called to Peru to work with grandmother ayahuasca and to deepen my, my learning with the Caro and um, with earth medicines there, my family thought I was in a shamanic cult. <laughs> they thought they thought I had been brainwashed and there was a lot going on. I was leaving a, um, a marriage that was completely misaligned. And, and so I was leaving an old life. Like I was shedding my skin. I was shedding the old shell, the paradigm of fear and unlearning. So I could really embody who I am at core soul level. And so there's so much um, religious trauma. Um, and if we look at systems based in fear, whether we're talking about government, religion, other systems, um, well, many, many systems based in fear are meant to control us. And so if we are not in our fullest expression, if we're not in our power, we can be easily man manipulated and controlled and thus um, kind of within the systems that, that are, you know, that are, have, have been created. Now, if we're in our power, if we, you know, are in our full freedom, then we are transcending those systems. So without getting, going down a complete rabbit hole, um, there's a lot of indoctrination. There's a lot of, um, programming. So I call it viral programming. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you, like, and they, it can come from different places, families of origin, religious systems. Um, and of course, you know, within religion, there are aspects that are truth, right? So like the energy of Christ consciousness, for example, and then there are aspects mm -hmm. more of like the religious organizational side that are based in fear. Um, spirituality, authentic spirituality is about freedom and sovereignty and embodying your unique power, power beyond the ego, just your essence, your presence. And, you know, we've been, healers have been persecuted, spiritualists have been persecuted across mm -hmm. history, um, again, for the purpose of fear and control. So we're in a time where I call it right now on this planet, the great remembering the great awakening, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in a time of remembering. And so it's important to understand that, you know, if it's funny, I have a feather here and different people may have different reactions to this. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion is if a spiritual object or any kind of spirituality, whether it's an object or just thinking about like shamanic practice, if it creates, if it triggers fear or judgment, that's your work to do. You see, it's your, it's the person that's experiencing the emotional activation, the trigger that that's some kind of viral programming within that they're meant to look at, whether they're willing to or not is that personal sovereign decision. But judgment and fear is what we're here to collectively alchemize. And the reality is, you know, we are, we are reprogramming just, you know, thousands of years of persecution, control and fear. So it can feel very dense at times. Yeah. And, you know, when, you know, as you were explaining, you know, why people react and behave and respond to different things differently. I was thinking about your work when, you know, how you use your work to, um, to kind of address blockages in people's lives. And, you know, in the beginning, you mentioned that every person is different and you will use different tools for a different person, which I think is really, really important because, you know, you know, our society is, I have a headache, we all get a, a painkiller. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I am thinking, no, I may just need water, she needs yeah. sleep, and, <laughs> and you actually need the painkiller, right? Yeah. 
Right. So I was, you know, when you said that, I was like, this is interesting because um, on your website, you talk about blockages and how you use your work to help people uh, work through their blockages and address the challenges that are connected to blockages in their life. Could you walk us through what these blockages are? And I'm yes. saying this only because some people may not be able to recognize blockages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I, you know, I know you're so you're tired of repeating the basics, but please. no, no, this is good. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's, and, yeah, yeah, it's important and such a good question because we use the you know if, we're, if we do this kind of work, we use words so often we forget. Oh, we have to like define what this is, right? Mm -hmm. For people, <laughs> so a blockage, I would define it as a an a subconscious thought form or belief that is out of alignment from your authentic self. And that subconscious thought form or belief creates an energy that is again out of alignment with your authentic self. So for example, so I do this exercise for those tuning in, this is a fabulous exercise. Mm -hmm. um, it's called, so it's called belief discovery. So going through um, a series of, of questions to excavate what I call the root of the roots of those subconscious self-limiting beliefs that are truly holding us back from embodying our most powerful selves. So we go through different categories. So what are your, um, what are those beliefs in the spiritual realm, spiritual religious, in the physical realm? like? physicality, body, money, physical world, in the emotional realm, in, in the mental realm. So, and this is like a, one exercise um, that's a part of a larger methodology that I, that I offer. And so through belief discovery, we begin to see our blockages. We begin to see, oh, okay, I desire abundance, but I'm seeing that I have a belief that I am unworthy of receiving goodness in my life. So you see, you create, you excavate these personal paradoxes that we all have. And those are direct illuminations. They're direct excavators of the blockages that we carry. And so then it's about uprooting that subconscious belief and then working with the energetic patterns that it's created in your body and in your energy field. So you're simultaneously reprogramming from the psyche and then you're releasing the energy and it's bi-directional. And um, so you work with both in order to reprogram that patterned emotional response and thus behavioral response. And you change your reality from there. <laughs> <Voila>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think you explained it really, really well. It, it's so beautiful. And I think um, the way you've explained it, it should be clear that there is no cookie cutter. You know, it can't be. It's impossible, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. So I think that was really, really beautifully put. And I wanted us to touch on something that is... Um, is very special to us here and that is the sacred feminine you work with the sacred feminine energy and uh, we have had several conversations with different women who embody this sacred feminine energy and are doing different work right and for you as a medicine woman as a shaman you are bringing a completely new perspective to this platform <laughs> i just want to say it to you um so i'd like you to um in your opinion and with this you know fascinating background what um, what do you think is the role of the sacred feminine in um, in the transformation of society? In mm. the what if using the ancient wisdom? Yeah. Yes. What a powerful question. From my vantage point, from my perspective, the role of the sacred feminine, the divine feminine in terms of the transformation of humanity and society and the earth is to be an instrument of, I'm just tuning into what words wanna come through, mm -hmm. is, to be an, is to be an instrument of 
rejuvenation, to be an, an instrument of healing and recalibration for Pachamama. So that means you are the earth. You are the earth. Our earth has a consciousness. You know, she is the great goddess, divine mother. She is the one that so generously supports us. You know, she gives us life. She gives us nurturing. She gives us sustenance, even when we harm her. That is unconditional love. And, and as, as a sacred feminine embodiment for those who really feel called to, to embody that medicine and be an instrument for that, your role is to be an embodiment of Pachamama Mother Earth and to be a vessel. You see, if you look at our chakra system, so mm -hmm. our seventh, our crown, all the way to our first, our root, Mm -hmm. And there's there's a there's an eighth over here connected to the oversoul. Okay. But if you look at the vertical construction of our chakra system, mm -hmm. the more open, the more open your channel is, again, you worked with your blockages, you do the inner work consistently, you are a literal portal for divine energy. So divine energy, meaning the energy of unconditional love, the angelic realms, maybe the energy of like Mother Mary or Quan Yin, these ascended masters that are sacred feminine um, embodiments or sacred feminine energies. And you can be a clear channel of all of that unseen energy grounded into the earth from crown to root. So you're a vessel of transformation, healing, and that, um, we'll call it that feminine flow of love. And so there's more I could say on that, but it's really being um, that vessel for for divine energy and also being an embodiment of mother earth as well. Yeah, I have like a thousand questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which angle to take when I take the Mother Earth angle, um, yes. you know, or the the chakra angle, or the the grid work angle. You know, <laughs> I talked to this really amazing guest, and mm -hmm. uh, actually Priscilla, and she mentioned the grid work mm -hmm. and how grid work is very important because when you do the energy work, you actually can heal, you, you know, your energy is able to heal the whole world, you know, you can push it out, you know, and I, I but I still stuck with me, right? Yeah. <laughs> and when you're mentioning this, I thought about that. And I don't know whether you also do this kind of work. Now, I'm not into labels, maybe you call it something else, but you talked about grounding. And you talked about this, you know, women embodying their energy, and then, you know, doing the work with, Pachamama. Pachamama, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, can you just try and help us paint a picture as to how a, you know a woman listening can actually do this work, um, yeah. and also tell us who is Pachamama? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to forget this. Like I, I was like, Faith, don't forget to ask her who is Pachamama. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's start there because that's yeah. you know we'll go we'll go ground up. How about that? Okay. Great. <laughs> so Pachamama is the Quechua word. Um, so this is the Peruvian shamanic term mm -hmm. for Mother Earth. So I call her Pachamama. She's connected with, I mean, she's the essence of everything, you know, if you especially in Peruvian shamanism and also shamanism around the world, it's all about earth medicine. So Pachamama is the feminine energy that they revere. That is the sustenance of life and, and why we all exist. So, so we call her Pachamama. And to me, the term Pachamama has a really potent and beautiful consciousness. So I can feel her essence, especially when I'm using that term and, um, 
just viewing it, viewing her as, I mean, she's her own embodiment in her own consciousness. So, so that's Pachamama and we, um, we, we work with her. The Mesa is very connected to Pachamama energy. And so I, for example, I'll work with Pachamama energy in session with people. I may you know, use my hands to help channel earth energy, Pachamama energy up into the person's system to decrease inflammation, to decrease mm -hmm. stress, to decrease um, any kind of emotional distress or imbalance. So Pachamama is, is everything. She's, she's very important. She's very important to all of us. Okay. Um, and remind me again, your second question, Faith. My second question is, because you talked about, you know, the sacred feminine energy, oh. using her essence yeah. to heal Mother Earth. And then that's when you mentioned Pachamama. Now she's connected to Pachamama and she can embody this um, energy to help heal the Earth. And it's kind yes. of like, you know, our role as women. And then, yes. yeah, my question was, how does this work and how can we all, you know, start doing it, basically? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we can all as, and that's part of the feminine's responsibility right now to do the work of dissolving the fear that we carry. For example, you know, it can look really um, kind of straightforward or um, in connected to relationship. If you look at the, um, the ecosystems that our earth has, you know, they're all interconnected. So for example, when we feel a sense of judgment or competition or separation, it's all about working with those parts that keep us separate, that keep us in fear. And that is, that is the work of the divine feminine because the divine feminine knows that she is endlessly abundant, that she is the creator, that she creates over and over and over, and there's no lack, there's no scarcity. So if there's no lack and scarcity, there's no competition. She knows that she is the goddess of rejuvenation, creation, expansion, birth. And so the more we can embody that energy of abundance, recreation, divinity, flow without force, you know, letting go of striving and being a divine magnet. So embodying the energy that we seek to attract into our lives. So if we want more wealth, we have to feel our wealthiness now. If we want more joy, then find joy in this present moment. You know, that is the role of of the feminine and all humans embody feminine, have feminine energy. Yes. Um, those who embody more feminine energy and women, uh, there's, there's more access to this particular energy and, and to be a vessel, you know, we can do this work every day. For example, in meditation, I'll go outside and plant my bare feet in the earth and I'll sit on the earth you know, with my knees crossed and I'll plant my bare feet in the earth and then I put my hands on the earth. Mm -hmm. So five access points into my physical body, the soles of my feet, my palms of my hands, and then my tailbone. So it's called five earthly gates. Mm -hmm. And I bring, bring or just visualizing sparkling ruby red earth energy moving up up, up into my body and into my root. So into my tailbone and pelvic bowl, and I will ground myself very deeply. And then I bring that earth energy. And this is a meditation. We all can do this. Um, I bring that earth energy up into my heart space. And I see that ruby red energy. And I connect my heart mm -hmm. with the heart of Pachamama. Okay. So just using your intention, your intention is profoundly powerful. So there you can send loving energy, healing energy from your heart down to the heart of Pachamama. And then you receive her earth energy in return. So you're receiving earth energy, which is so healthy and vibrant for your system. And then you're sending healing, love energy, gratitude energy down into the earth. And you can imagine that 
using your intention and your third eye, you can imagine that energy, the loving energy surrounding the earth, surrounding Pachamama. So I don't call it grid work, but it is, it is, you know, there's different terms, but yeah, seeing, yeah, different words. Yeah, yeah. 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 seeing all of the continents and the oceans just surrounded in that beautiful, unconditionally loving energy. And I see that unconditional love energy as um, kind of like a rose gold, like a pink color, just surrounding the earth. So we can all do this very simple, but powerful meditation to heal ourselves and also to heal Pachamama. Because when we, and I want, I really, really desire for people listening to take this in. When we heal ourselves authentically, we are healing Pachamama. And we have to understand that when we heal ourselves, it's not just for ourselves, it's in service of her and humanity as well. So getting out of that individualistic paradigm and into the more collective paradigm of why we're even having this conversation or why people are even seeking healing at all. So, um, so that's a really beautiful way to do this collective divine feminine grid work, global healing work, wherever you are in the world. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I think, you know, Lena, I think people do know something is missing. Uh, but they cannot put a finger on it. Like what exactly is missing? Because, you know, there's a stronghold. I call it a stronghold on the cultural, traditional, religious, um, you know, uh, systems, you know, that we are born into. It's not, it's not a choice, really. You know, you're born into it. It's what you know. It's who you are, identity. You know, we get it. So I think as you're talking about our collective responsibility, I think to all of our listeners it's so important like she said because when we are looking at everything happening we have to know that we are the solution actually and and she said something that every single person can do it doesn't matter your social class your economics your background it's your intention and you know and and just do it do it the way you know it you know you you mentioned you've said this repeatedly everyone is different right so right. there's no one way fits all just do it because it's for your children it's for your family it's for yourself you know right. and you are living because of you know mother earth you know the food every sustenance everything is because of her so you know to me it makes sense to give back yeah. right <laughs> Yes, she's help her out, you know, because come on, you know, she feeds you, she takes care of you. You know, why not? Why yeah. not give her your best shot? You know, right? I mean, that's the we call it sacred reciprocity. Ooh, you know, nice. sacred reciprocity is a term that really means that you receive just as much as you give, and you give just as much as you receive. And at times, if we're of service, perhaps we give more than we receive, and that can be a beautiful thing. But it's the medicine, it's the energy that's going to help to heal all of the extractive energy and the taking energy that we're seeing with Mother Earth, because she needs us. I mean, the reality is she needs us right now. Yeah, the reality. Yeah, yeah, and reality. it's a harsh reality, and and there's an urgency there, you know. To, to embody your own healing so you can be of service to humanity and to her. And, and so I'm, that's my mission is to guide people um, on their path of healing, awakening and transformation so they can be of service. So we can live in more harmony and we can help heal her. So um, yeah. And everyone's different. Every, like you said, every path, and you have to honor that. And everyone has their own pace too. So I'm not saying like, you know, that we need to harm ourselves kind of in this accelerated awakening. We have to pace ourselves, but the reality is, you know, there's there is a need for more and more people to wake up. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, you talked about um, sacred reciprocity. And it got me thinking about something maybe some people might think, oh, okay, that's controversial. But I want to share it because I'm talking to a shaman here, right? <laughs> so, you know, I see a lot of people saying, I need to go and release all my energy, you know, to the trees and in the water. And this never sat right with me, Lena. And please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. Absolutely, I'm fine with that. Because I th I always felt like, why do you feel that you cannot do your work enough to not have enough negative stuff to dump onto her? You know, uh, she's already doing a lot of work for you, but your all release work, I'm going to dump on. Why do you keep piling up all this stuff and just dumping it? So when you mentioned sacred reciprocity, I felt something like, yeah, I, I think we should talk about people saying, just go and give it to the trees, give it to the earth, give it to the water. I'm thinking, no, you should heal, like you said, so that you're not overburdening her more than she's already overburdened. Mm. I don't know what your take is from a shamanic perspective. This is just my blatant observation. You know, it oh, never it's... sat well with me, but I'm sure there are reasons for that. <laughs> Well, I would say <clears throat> that's very beautiful, intuitive reasons why, <clears throat> excuse me, why you felt that way, because that, we'll call it that mindset is still very individualistic. Like I need to get this out. I'm just going to dump it into the earth or on this person or whatever. Um, the way we may work with that. Yeah. Pachamama <clears throat> loves to alchemize. She loves to alchemize dense energy. But how are we in relationship to her? Are we give are we dumping our heavy energy into her and then littering or you know not living in a as sustainably as we're able to or um are we harming her in other ways? You know, look at the way we live our life you know, just really honestly, without judgment, are there ways we can be more sustainable? Are there ways that we can be less harmful to her? And I think that's the personal responsibility piece. Um, and from a shamanic perspective, every time that you are taking from her, just say you pick an apple off of a tree or you take a shell, you know, from the beach or something, you give back. So you give an offering. So wherever I go, especially if I'm arriving in a new land or a new place, mm -hmm. I always give an offering. It may be a little bit of dried tobacco. It may be some flower essences. It may be, you know, a sacred object, but I, you give offerings to her each time you receive from her. So that's a way, a very easy way. And I have a little medicine bag where I keep, you know, just like organic um, dried tobacco from Peru. And I give just, you know, it's very simple, just a little prayer and offering. And I sprinkle some tobacco on the earth as that offering when I'm arriving in a new place. So we can all do that in our own way to, to practice sacred reciprocity. Um, and, and knowing, you know, she, she does, she wants to help us alchemize our energy, but in the light of sacred reciprocity, how are we honoring her as well? How are we treating her well? So we don't just want <clears throat> to dump. We want to be in that beautiful relationship exchange. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. So there's a reason why you felt that way. <laughs> yeah, there was a reason. It bothered me, you know, because people yeah. were talking. Yeah, sometimes I'm bombarded by when I see people talking about, yeah, I'm just going to, you know, you know, you know, let it go in nature. I'm like, what are you you're dumping literally? Right. Right. <laughs> but right. I thought there was something wrong because I knew, I mean, I know they have a reason for doing that, you know. Sure, yeah. it wrong. I'm not judging. I just wanted to understand it, you know. And yes. I think you explained it really well. So next time, people, when you go to your beautiful, whatever you call it, give back something. <laughs> give back something. And she receives it. You know, on Mother's Day, yeah. I had, for example, on Mother's Day, I had these old roses that I had and they were, you know, they were dried at that point. So I, I took off all of the petals and I did um, offering to our great mother, Mother Earth, in the river and just let them, you know, it's just very simple, but I let the the petals 
um, flow down the river. And we did that with some family and it was like things like that. We can do that anywhere, you know, whether we're in a city or, you know, out remote somewhere, she's always there, whether she's under concrete or not. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I can't help, you know, I'm still on the Pachamama, right? <laughs> And I have an, another question, you know, and I ask all my guests to talk about Mother Nature because some people call her Mother Gaia. Mm -hmm. Some people call her um, Tara and some people call her Tiamat. And then you call her Pachimama. No. <laughs> and I noticed, um, Lena, there are differences when people speak about her as Gaia. And when people speak about her as Tiamat and when people speak about her as you know, whatever name they um, relate to her as, do you know what the differences are and why she has all these names? Do you know what that means? You know, this is a great question and I don't really have a great answer for it. I just, you know, I feel like those names originated obviously in different places and mm. in different dialects and languages. And so it all means the same thing, but you're, you're right. You know, there's maybe a different tone of the way people talk about her, depending on the name that they, they give her. Um, but I feel like it's very cultural. Um, oh, yeah. Even, even though, yeah, I feel like it's very cultural. And even though, again, like it's all, we're all, going through different doors into the same house of Mother Earth, Mother Gaia, Pachamama, um, depending on the lineage or the culture where those terms originated, there may be subtle differences. Mm. Yeah, because it's definitely a different tone in, yeah. you know, and a different approach, you know, and some talk to talk about her like, you know, she's this is my own interpretation, but it's like, you know, she's a maiden, she's a mother, she's a crone, like they're different stages, almost. I feel like it, I have no evidence for this, but they talk about her more like, this is more emotional. Like she's, you know, she's a fighter. Like she's more, you know, like a tough woman, you know, and, they, and I, felt, <laughs> I felt this with every different, um, you know, um, yeah, label <laughs> she's yeah. given, right? Um, and I wanted us to talk a little bit more about the sacred, um, the sacred feminine energy, mm -hmm. because, you know, we had a show where we're talking about the goddess energy and how, you know, a lot of the history and the knowledge was erased and um, it was hidden. And, um, and now it's like women, you know, we are collecting the pieces, trying mm. to do some patchwork and um you know and because there is very little um knowledge there's a lot of knowledge but again it's little because it's not made mainstream you know it's kind right. of like you found it nobody knows about it yeah so it's kind of seen you know it's kind of pushed aside or people make a mockery of it or they ridicule it or they belittle it oh it's just goddess stuff oh yeah sacred feminines woo -woo stuff so i think <laughs> I think we should kind of um, talk a little bit about the importance of embodying um, the goddess, the sacred feminine um, energy and the wisdom connected to it. It's not just woo stuff. You know, there's a lot of wisdom, ancient wisdom that can help us today in the times that we're in today. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you're so right. The, the ancient wisdom is the foundation and the the different incarnations and aspects of the sacred feminine tap into different kind of energies so for example we'll say Quan yin the female buddha of compassion um, originating from asia and more of the buddhist lineages you know again beyond religion she's an energy of compassion so that's a great example of when we are in a place of suffering in our life, maybe loss or, you know, feeling the change of life, pain, grief, then we can call on these deep energies to help alchemize our own discomfort, suffering in order to be of service to the world. And you can read a lot about, um, 
think there's a book, it's called Becoming Kuan Yin, for example. It's a beautiful philosophical book on that aspect, you know, that particular incarnation of the, of the sacred feminine. Mm-hmm. Um, if we need to really activate and alchemize something, like we're in a deep death and rebirth process, maybe we call on Mother Kali from the Hindu lineage. And she is like the tough alchemizer um, of suffering. And so there's that fiery energy of burning it down to rebirth. So there's deep wisdoms in all of these incarnations, you know, thousands of years old, you know, there are whole temples in India dedicated to Mother Kali and and her energy. And so um, these energies are not separate from ourselves. We're just remembering that we are instruments of these energies. We, we can cultivate and conjure up these energies for the purpose of healing transformation and creating more harmony on our planet. And so the wisdoms, it's important to understand that, yeah, we can talk about goddess energy, um, that divinity, you know, the, the beauty, like being unapologetic in your beauty and in your power and being in your flow um, and like being like the blossoming creation of whatever your, your heart, your soul desires. And at the core, you know, there's so, there are many wisdoms that we can learn about that really support the different incarnations of the goddess. And so it's rooted in spiritual, mystical history across space and time. Um, and you're, like you said, it's like we're cobbling it together. We have got we got to go researching to read about it in an actual text. But there are some great um, there are some great books out there that are speaking to this, and there's going to be more and more um, that come as more and more divine feminine teachers, sacred feminine teachers are sharing. But this is this is deep, and I really challenge anyone who. Um, has the residual story that the sacred feminine is weak. It's not rooted in, you know, in history that it's just this fleeting concept. It's actually one of the most important wisdom traditions that we must excavate and share with the world at this time. Yeah, and and um, I want to remind our listeners that we can you can move beyond the labels. You know, we use the word goddess, sacred, feminine, mother, alternate. Just take what works for you. You know, because we are beyond the labels. You know, you can call yourself a queen or a goddess, sacred, divine, feminine, the mother. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you 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 really um, understand the seriousness of what we are talking about here mm-hmm. and the importance of embodying. Um, who you are authentically, <laughs> that's what yes. um, Lena keeps talking about, and healing so that when you start um, supporting um, the alignment of um, the mother, Mother Earth, your home, <laughs> that <Hello>. um, <laughs> your home, yeah, right here, <laughs> right here. <laughs> not there, right here. <laughs> Yeah, but that you actually, you know, understand your responsibility in 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 helping build your home, protect it, you know, feed it, nurture it, you know, and do all that good stuff. Yeah, and um, and Lena, you know, um, just before we head out of here, I'd like you to touch on anything that we might have left out, um, that maybe perhaps I forgot to ask you about your work or the projects you're working on that you'd like to share with our audience. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is everything we talked about today. Faith is a is deeply connected to the work that that I share. I'm in the process of creating more and more structured teachings, immersive mm-hmm. teachings around the sacred feminine, mm-hmm. around the divine feminine, specifically in the realm of sacred feminine leadership. So for those 
women who are called to bring forth these teachings into the world in their own way. You know, the, the teachings are created to, to really complement your medicine, your unique gifts, your energy, your vibration. And so there's a lot in the works right now. Um, what I, what I will share that I feel is just, it's so deeply connected to my soul's mission. And I'm grateful to be offering again this year. So our annual expand Peru trip in September, which is a spiritual initiation journey that, um, that's going to be September 21st through 29th. And we'll be traveling through the sacred Valley with with my beloved shamanic family doing different initiations and ceremonies at different sacred sites in the sacred Valley. Uh, There will be an optional plant medicine ceremony as well. And that's, again, it's a life-changing experience. And for those who feel the calling to learn more, direct learning from the elders about um, Peruvian shamanism. That's something that, that we're excited to offer. And, you know, I just, I encourage everyone tuning in to, to really ask the question to themselves and to continually ask because, because the answers will unfold as you sit with them. But what is my medicine? What is my unique gift that I'm meant to share with the world? Because that is a big part of why you're here on earth. So, um, and you are the medicine and it's important that we, we embody whatever that is unapologetically and powerfully. Lena, you can't just say something like that before we head out. (laughs) (laughs) You just said you are the medicine. Come on now. (laughs) <laughs> Break that down just a little bit before I know we have one leg out the door. But okay. <laughs> just... I know, I know. Okay, so let me, let me. Yeah, please, just tell meaning. me. How, how are they the medicine? <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning that your the gifts that you have, like maybe you're a magnificent painter, or maybe you are meant to work with children and help awaken children. Maybe you're you know feminine, sacred feminine leader. Um, you you are the energy that the world needs to heal, that Pachamama needs to heal. So you, when you activate your gifts and you share them, you are medicine. So that's what I mean by you are the medicine. Your soul's purpose is the medicine and and you're here to share it. Yeah, I love it. And I think I'm glad I I asked this because people would, you know what, you know, that's why labels are very dangerous because we Mm -hmm. take them in finality. Medicine means pills and doctors, you know? And and so they're like, oh, what is she, you know, what is she doing? She's medicine, you know, but they, medicine means so many things. So many right? things, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I thank yeah, you yeah. for clarifying. And and that's why I always say like this, it's almost, I feel like for, for me, it's a reclamation of the term. So I'm, I'm, we're kind of like taking back the term medicine mm-hmm. and redefining it in a way that's really more connected to its essence anyhow yeah i love it i love it thank you thank you so much lena for stopping by i absolutely enjoyed today's share i i really 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 think that you have shared a very very unique perspective that um, might might (laughs) might help people look differently at you know a medicine woman or a shaman and remove the woo woo out of it you know (laughs) yeah you you really (laughs) made it seem you know, simple and not so woo-woo, you know. I think that's a beautiful thing, you know, if you have the gift to do that. Um, So before we head out here, I'd like you to share where people can reach you, find your work and all that good stuff. Yes, so you can connect with me on social, so Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter. I'm most active on on Instagram, Mm -hmm. and it's at... I am Lena Franklin, L-E-N-A Franklin. So I am Lena Franklin. And DM me if you have any questions or um, if I can support you in any way. And then my website is lenafranklin.com. So that's pretty easy. And you can see all about the work that I offer, international immersions and, and other offerings on my website. 
Yeah, perfect. So thank you, everybody, for stopping by. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support. This was today's smart guest and smart sister, Lena Franklin, who is a medicine woman. Yeah, but now we know what medicine means, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's more than just the word. So um, I want to remind you all that all her information, which is quite extensive and in-depth, is in the description section of this um, interview. So please remember to stop by, take a look, click on the links and see what piques your interest and then just explore and feel free to connect. You have ask and you shall receive, right? So Thank you, everybody. Lena, thank you for stopping by. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, thank you Faith. Honored thank to you. have been here. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye.